Welcome back. You're listening to Through a Glass Darkly Radio on United Public Radio. The intro music that you listened to was Mark of the Doomslayer by Carl Casey uh, at White Bat Audio. And today we have one of my favorite guests who's appeared many times on Through a Glass Darkly. And today will be his first appearance uh, on Through a Glass Darkly Radio. And that is Preston Dennett. Now, Preston Dennett is a field investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, a ghost hunter, a paranormal researcher, and the author of more than 30 books and more than 100 articles about UFOs and the paranormal. So I want to extend a very warm welcome to my friend, Preston Dennett. Preston. Hey, Welcome, Sean. my friend. Thank it's you. always great to see you. <laughs> always great to be here. Thank you. All right. So there's been a lot of stuff <laughs> in the news. It's been kind of crazy town in uh, UFO world with the Arrow report that was, you know, basically uh, gas gaslighting of the entire American people, which was fantastic. Uh, but today I just kind of going to want to go way back. You spent your entire career working on tabulating the accounts of experiencers and contactees who have reported various uh, types of ETs in, you know, in, in their experiences. So what I want to kind of do tonight is go through, you know, using those reports as that you've tabulated as primary source documents, kind of what are the most common ETs that you see? And then kind of go through each type, describe kind of sim similarities that you often tend to see in different reports, and, and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, sure. Well, it's kind of an endless parade of different types of humanoids. <laughs> so it's, you know, in some ways easy to categorize, in other ways hard. One thing I did notice right off the bat was they are humanoid, which I thought was super interesting because that's sort of what kept me out of the UFO field. It was very Star Trek-like. You know, I'd hear about it on TV shows every now and then. Not like today. Uh, it was pretty <laughs> rare. Uh, but that right. yeah, was always humanoid. And I thought, mm, just don't think ETs would look that way. Of course, I was just assuming based on my own assumptions, uh, which you know turned out to be pretty wrong, actually. But my first case involved typical grays, as you would think of it, mm -hmm. from a family member, actually, who was walking by Stag Street Elementary School in Van Nuys, Southern California. This was back in the late 1970s. She was a college student. She's an artist. Got a great eye for detail, but described, you know, the typical grays. She said they were about five feet tall, very slender, wearing olive green jumpsuits with mandarin collars. She's an artist, she's got every detail, but huge pear-shaped heads with very large, liquidy, dark wraparound eyes, mm -hmm. almost no nose or mouth, uh, white as chalk. So that was my first case. And that was followed shortly later by someone at work, a lady who's dead. What year was that? Like how far back was that? That was, uh, we pinned it down to about 1978. Okay but it could be, you know, a year or so in either direction. You know, she was in college. It wasn't her first year. It wasn't her last. So it was somewhere around there. But yeah, she, I mean, she was close. She was walking on the sidewalk and they were in front of this, standing in front of the school of all places, right under the floodlight. Her dog was with her, her dog, Sarah. Dog didn't react at all. So, <laughs> but she, yeah, close enough that she knew these were not human. Um, I mean, she first thought they were kids as she walked up to them, people wearing masks, going through what J. Allen Hynek calls, calls theory escalation, because your brain doesn't want to go, you know, this is aliens. It wants to find a normal conventional explanation. So that and was my first, it was Gray's. And, and what time of night was that? You said they were, she, they were no, standing underneath the light. It was approaching midnight. So, okay. yeah. She, so she, she thought they were kids, but you know, it's far too late for kids of that age to be out. They were closer to four feet rather than five feet, but they're and about. What did they do when, when she, <laughs> she kind of got too close and then realized that 
they weren't kids. You know, it was really interesting, she, she said, because actually when she approached, they were facing each other so close, it looked almost like they were kissing, but mm -hmm. they weren't. Uh, they just appeared to be looking into each other's eyes about you know inches away. And as she walked right up to them, and she's maybe 10 feet away, they swiveled and kind of turned like opening a book is how she described it. She said they almost seemed to be floating an inch or two off the ground. She couldn't confirm that because she didn't really look down to see at their feet. Uh, didn't really see their hands or their feet really at all because she wasn't paying attention to that. But they just, they locked gazes with her. <laughs> I mean, they stared right at her. And she said it was like being woken up when you're already awake. It was a complete revelation. And she didn't want to panic. You know, she's a pretty tough lady anyway. Mm -hmm. But she didn't scream or panic or run. She just walked away as fast as she could without running. because She did not want to panic. And didn't look back. Doesn't believe she had missing time. Uh, but she did have an earlier sighting, you know, just months prior to this. So that could be a connection there. It's something we do see. A sighting followed by a closer encounter. And it turned out her son <laughs> would later have a humanoid come into a glowing blue being. And mm -hmm. this was, of course, decades later. She's married and has kids. My nephew was about eight or nine and had he had seen a UFO right outside his bedroom window, pretty high up there. This is in Topanga Canyon, California, a known hotspot. Right. And uh, it was shortly after that that he was with his friend. And they woke up in the middle of the night to the room glowing and this bl glowing blue being came in. And he doesn't really remember anything other than that. No real detail to it. But it's the pattern. I mean, this is in my family. We know this as researchers that it does tend to run in families. So was the, um, the glowing blue being, was that uh, different from a gray? I would say yes, but I can't really say for sure because he was so young. It was so brief. And, you know, he would start to forget about it. And I'd go up to him, you know, every time I went to visit, I'm like, you, me you remember, right? Because I know how these things work. <laughs> I'm not going to let him forget. And he's, he's like, oh, yeah, that's right. So he didn't get a whole lot of detail to it, unfortunately. It could have been. It might not have been. The best he could say it was some, it was humanoid. And it was glowing. So, I mean, I wish there was more detail to it. And he hasn't had anything since then. Though my other nephew did have a very close up sighting while swimming in a pool in Hawthorne, to the, you know, south of LA. And that's it, where SpaceX is, right? Uh, is it? Um, I don't know. If yeah. That's where I mean, it is. I don't know if it still is, but it, it, it certainly was there for a while. It probably is still there. Now it's not too far from Seal Beach Naval Weapons Station, and I mean California's riddled with stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he saw a very close-up UFO. But yeah, so that was my first case of a humanoid, <laughs> and it was a gray. And it's funny because there was a few books out there. You know, there was Betty and Barney Hill's book. I think Jim and Coral Lorenzen had a book out, and Charles Bowen's book, The Humanoids. But there really wasn't much else. I mean, there was a few. There was a book on Roswell, Betty Andreessen book. But she had never read any of those. She had no conception that this was even being written about and didn't even use the word ET at first um, until I was like, you know what? <laughs> I, you know, as she's going from head to toe describing this, I'm like, gosh, if she says these, you know, details, the, the big eyes, the white skin, I'm going to lose my mind. And that was, for me, a tipping point. Like, there is something to this. <laughs> There's no way she could know this. And I'm predicting what she's going to say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my first case was Gray's. So was my second. Lady I worked with, I'll call her Diane, because she did not want her name used. But she and her whole family had seen lights over Camp Julian in the San Bernardino Mountains. This was again late 70s, I think. But the both the, the young daughters who were, you know, teenage 16, 17, 18, started seeing UFOs over Reseda and a crowded, crowded suburb area. You wouldn't think anything could show up there, but they did. And that was when the 
youngest daughter who at age 19 woke up to see grays in her bedroom. And they're like, and I asked her, what do they look like? And she says, you know, honestly, I didn't get a really good look at them because I took one look and they scared the living daylights out of me. But she said they had very light skin, very large dark eyes, were super skinny, looked almost like leathery reptilian kind of skin, she said. And uh, they said, you know, come with us. Ha don't be afraid, but you need to come with us. She started arguing with them. <laughs> like, I can't go. I have a job. You know, I have a family. I have to go to school. You know, I can't go with you. And next thing she knows, and this is all recalled fully consciously. She's lying in this round room, very small, on a table. They're surrounding her. And they said, can we cut your arm? And she said, no. They did it anyway. And then they said, well, we need to do an operation on your brain. And she just lost her mind at that point mm -hmm. and fell unconscious. But I talked to her like the next day. She didn't work where I worked. This was her mother who uh, I worked with. And she told me this. And she says, well, you know, she's coming in today. You can talk to her. And I did. It was like the day after the, you know, two days. And she's like, yeah, here's where they cut my arm. I saw the little healed up scar, you know, it heals up very quickly. And this is what she described. She ended up having four visitations where they'd come in and talk to her, gave her predictions, actually. She said, they said, this, you're going to get a raise at work. <laughs> you're going to have some trouble with your boyfriend. They talked a little bit about religion, interestingly enough. What did they say about religion? N nothing that she could distinctly recall in any detail just that they seemed to be interested in it uh, and what her thoughts were on it. But she said the stuff they told her did actually come true. Uh, and she said, ultimately, it was a benevolent experience. She doesn't feel like they were out to harm her, even though it was really scary. And uh, she just says, I wish they would just knock on the door during the daytime and ask, because coming into my room at night, you know, really scared her. Yeah, why? In all the research that you've done, have they ever alluded to the reason that they do that specifically, they being the greys? Like come at night, don't kind of come under normal circumstances? Um, well, not in a whole, not really, somewhat. You know, I did interview Dolly Safran and wrote, wrote a book about her case. And she, it's her understanding that the reason they do that is because that's you're in a they know where they're going to be able to find you and mm -hmm. uh, you're undressed you're relaxed uh, they don't have to fly around during the day when the magnetic fields are more uh, unstable they're more stable at night without the sun you know coming down and wreaking havoc uh, there were various reasons but for whatever reason it, it people have a hard time with it as, you know, people ask, well, you know, you're, where are you most likely to see ETs? In your bedroom, honestly. <laughs> That's where most people will see them. Uh, or, you know, on a craft, of course. But And sometimes walking down the street or on a lonely highway or what have you. But that is most common. Bedroom visitations, they're called. And my third case was Gray's as well. Uh, a lady I'll call Wendy. Um, basically, I met her... <laughs> When I went to go see a Chris, Max, the crystal skull, <laughs> who happened to be coming to my neighborhood, and I thought, well, why not? I, mm -hmm. Crystal skull sounds interesting. And it was. I don't know what to think of it, really. I didn't get any magic vibes from it. <laughs> but it certainly was interesting. And she sat next to me. And we just started talking. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm in interested in UFOs. And she's like, oh, well, I, I've got a story for you. And she was originally from Georgia. and as a young kid had these guys coming into her room and it went up all through um, to till young adulthood. And she again described grays and very scary for her at first until she started waking up to all these psychic abilities and they healed her of a cyst. Uh, and just, it's just kind of went from scary to really deeply, profoundly spiritual for her. But yeah, graze again. And it went like that for a while. 
um, graze, 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 until I started to get other cases. I got a Bigfoot case <laughs> at one point, uh, but human-looking ETs, praying mantis, those would be the top three uh, by far, I would say. Grays, no, then so human-looking, then praying mantis. So st staying with the grays for a little bit, have there been like a cluster of potential location by the way i know the answers to many of these questions because we talked before so if it sounds like i'm asking you like i told sean that it's yes you did I <laughs> for the audience uh, so have they ever been pinned down or mentioned where they're from at any time or are they from multiple places or is it still kind of a mystery well in my own files it took a long time to get any real solid answers but of course i read everything i can get my hands on and the Betty and Barney Hill case, which was one of the first to get any publicity, seemed to point towards Zeta Reticula. Mm -hmm. But if you look into that, it's not really a <laughs> place for planets. Uh, but that did come up in other cases as well. Uh, I started to hear all kinds of stuff that you couldn't really verify. Orion kept coming up. Mm -hmm. And I finally did start getting cases of people who were told by the Greys that they came from the Orion constellation somewhere in that area. Dolly pinned it down. I'm like, okay. She's like, you know, that's the third star. There's the one right below it. That's their son. And I'm like, wow, because I had just interviewed another guy. Mike is his name, who basically had that pinpointed as well. And other people have told me that, but often I, I won't get answers for the, I should say the contactees won't because I did, interviewed a couple from Hawaii who were driving through Sedona and had a UFO in front of their car, kind of made them follow it. Then it would go behind him and follow them. And finally it dived into the ground or so they thought. But when they got to their hotel, it was two hours later than it should have been. And they were having some partial recall, not really, but they certainly had a history of encounters, both of them separately and together, but did go under hypnosis with someone who you know, has done this before, an experienced hypnotherapist, and he couldn't recall anything, but she did. Uh, she recalled being not taken on board so much as this craft landing in the field and the door opening and then waving over. It's like, do you want to come on board? I said, sure. And they were largely human looking, though probably more accurately, a, I don't know, hybrid. I hate to say it without more information, but she said they were human looking and had large dark eyes and bald heads, but could have passed for human down the street if they wore a hat and glasses, mm -hmm. sunglasses. Uh, were about five and a half feet tall or slender, did look very much alike. And that's an important detail because anytime I get human looking ETs, they're described very much like twins or brothers and sisters, very close to identical, if not identical. And uh, she she had the requisite physical exam. Her husband was taken to another room and he was presumably being examined. And she's asking all these questions <laughs> like, you know, who are you? And they said, uh, where do you come from? Is what she asked them. And they said, well, we're from a place what did they say? Um, it's not important. You know, we're from a place you yeah. understand. And that's what they told Melinda Leslie, another lady I interviewed. You know, it, it doesn't really matter <laughs> where we're from. Um, you don't need to know that. And often they'll give coy or evasive answers, which it's frustrating, but in some ways understandable because we're so violent and ready to shoot first and ask questions later that would you give your home address to someone? <laughs> no. Hmm. <laughs> but no, yeah. If were, yeah. If somebody were operating in the U S military on foreign soil, they, you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't even give their name. You know, yeah, most cases that they'll say something like, well, I won't say most, but in a number of cases I've gotten, they'll say, it's not important. You wouldn't understand. We're from up there. <laughs> uh, this sort of thing, slightly coy, slightly evasive or sometimes in the literature certainly they'll be like we're from mars we're from venus 
Like, no, you're it not. Depends on, <laughs> yeah, it depends on like you know how early in human history it is, right? <laughs> I think that sometimes they will deliberately place kind of elements of high strangeness to just sort of give skeptics a way out, a doorway out. Like, I'm not believing this because this was said, or right. even the experiencer themselves. I don't know, because there's these weird high strangeness elements to it that sort of force people to consider new ideas, perhaps, or think out of the box, or change the way of thinking. Uh, but yeah, it's hard to say where exactly they're from. But I would say Orion for sure. Some have said in the Andromeda Galaxy, and I'm like, mm, no, you know, that doesn't pin it down at all. Right. <laughs> Why would you? And so, yeah, it's like yeah. saying I'm from the Milky Way Galaxy. Well, yeah, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> Where? Yeah. What about motivations? Do they ever say why? Oh, certainly. Why here? Yeah. yeah, and this is much more easy to pin down after you interview. And, and they, and, again, specifically the Greys, specifically the Greys, because there'll be others. Yeah, well, it's pretty much the same motivation across the board, apparently. And this is my assessment based on the first 10 cases that I've researched and what I've read. Uh, but I think it's pretty easy to pin down because, yeah, some people are taken on board and they're losing their minds and they don't get any information other than the ET saying, calm down, calm down, calm down. And the person basically goes unconscious and they don't get any information. But those who have a little bit of calmness and don't have a huge fight or flight response uh, do get information and we'll ask and they'll tell you. And basically the... They're, they will examine you. This is most common. And they're, they say, well, you've got this problem. We're checking up. You're doing well. You know, you're progressing fine. This is exactly, you're at the right stage. So it apparently is about health. And I really kind of came to that conclusion pretty early on when I kept getting healing cases. And that was the subject of my first book. Because I found 100 cases ultimately over the space of a year, yeah. But 30 right off the bat. I mean, I just did a quick sort of scan of the literature. I'm like, well, here's 30 cases. What is going on here? People aren't talking about this. They're acting like, oh, they're experimenting on us. And I'm finding people who are healed of cuts and bruises and nearsightedness and rheumatism and cysts and cancer. And I mean, you name it. Now I've got 300 plus cases, which I've collected basically. So that, and they will tell you this flat out. They're like, oh, well, you've got a problem with your stomach. You know, you've got an issue here. Are you aware that you, you know, this sort of thing. Some people have no idea, some do, that they're ill. But then they will basically, I think one of their primary agendas or missions or goals mm -hmm. is to uh, impart information. And that would take the form of three or four different general messages, one being warnings against nuclear proliferation. That's huge. It's usually the first thing that comes up. You know, what, we know where all your missile bases are. We can stop them. One guy said that. And they showed another person maps of every single anything to do with nuclear. They basically will tell you, you're destroying areas you don't even know about. You're on the verge of total self-annihilation. What are you doing? You need to tell people to stop doing this. Right. So it's also one lady up in Maine, they told her flat out, you need to tell people that thoughts are real, that if you keep sending out the negativity and the greed and the corruption, you're going to destroy yourselves. We did that in our distant past, and you're on that pathway. You need to tell people to stop putting out this greed and anger. Um, they're warned against war and aggression. That's pretty common. They warn against pollution, the destruction of the environment. And sometimes it goes beyond that. They'll actually you know, predict and say, these events are going to happen. Hurricanes, earthquakes, landslides, hurricane. I mentioned hurricanes. Uh, but you know, generally, major earth changes or even social changes. They told one lady who was a diehard supporter of Ross Perot, said, you need to stop doing that. <laughs> if you need to get out of the political system, it's going to fall apart. There's going to be a civil war at some point between all of the 
people in politics. And if you are a part of it, you're a part of the problem. Stop mm -hmm. it. And she did overnight. She said her political aspirations went right by the wayside and she stopped doing it. One lady, she told me, well, now I'm just collecting seeds. That's what they wanted me to do. I, I, got, a, I, I got a super thanks question from Moon Man. Thank you very much, Moon oh. Man. But just, just to step in really quick and then we'll get back on the on the thread. Yeah. Um, Preston, have you ever heard of the ETs building hi hidden infrastructure or building infrastructure that is co-located with Earth but not accessible to us, um, that they describe it as what humans might call dark matter? Mm, not really in those words, no. I can't say that I have. I think there's a lot of speculation about underground bases. Mm -hmm. And some people do report being taken to what they perceive to be an underground base, but they can't really tell because they're not really looking outside and seeing everything. And it could very well be just a large craft underwater or for that matter in the ground. There is evidence of stuff on the moon, I think, that comes from the contactee perspective as well as from NASA insiders and what have you. Yeah, to your point, I think last week there was something on Google Earth that it's still on the U.S. Geological Survey like website, so it's off of the west coast of the United States. There's a, uh, a west coast anomaly in the kind of, I mean, it's very, I mean, it's like I this whole shape that. is very clear. Yeah, yeah, and then Google scrubbed it, like literally scrubbed it last week. So I heard about that. Yeah, the Malibu anomaly. <laughs> yeah, I dug deep yeah, into that nice. because some guy very early on sent me the, you know, the coordinates and said, you need to look into this. This is where all the, you're getting all these reports of USOs. It's right in this area. I'm like, well, yeah, it is. And this does look unusual because it had this very flat, smooth surface, what looked like pillars, what appears yeah. to be a tunnel. It's sycamore null. It's an earthquake fault. I was, I've always been kind of on the fence about it because some Google images show what looks pretty much like a natural geological formation and others, gosh, it looks like a tunnel there. <laughs> and some of those, I mean, they do look like pillars. And I was leaning towards the artificial structure and I still do actually. Um, yeah, it's, it's too perfect to be something that's purely natural. Yeah, right? and I think what really clinched it for me because I, I ended up writing a book about USOs and that mm -hmm. was a whole chapter in that book because, you know, Jimmy Church ended up using Google applications to really get some astounding images and he popularized it. It's like, wow, this, there's something to this. But I interviewed, gosh, the guy who wrote the song Wipeout, Merrill Fankhauser, mm -hmm. uh, who got all into this because he started using some weird beeping tones that were coming from that area, from unsourced location in that area, from a radio ham who was picking it up and they could not pinpoint it, but it was somewhere there. And he used them in his songs. And so I was kind of emailing back and forth with Merrill and you know it's very sweet to respond. But he emailed me back a year or two later after I'd put out the book and said, you know, I've got some news for you about this Malibu anomaly. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said he was in Las Vegas and met with a Chumash Native American elder. Uh -huh. They, of course, being the people who in inhabited that area for a couple of thousand years prior to, you know, the Americans or Europeans, I should say, coming over <laughs> and taking over. But at any rate, this Chumash elder said that they are aware of this structure and they did not build it, but that they used to, that, that the sea level, according to their oral tradition, was much lower at that time and they could actually fish off the edge of it. But the implication was it was built. So wow. that, I'm like, wow, well, you know, they would know, they were there, they were on it. They have a long oral tradition. We know that Chumash, Gabrielano, uh, Indians, Native Americans lived there. Uh, so Did they have a sense was, of who built it, though? No, no. Mm. But if you look at it, it looks like it could. I mean, it looks built, but it's obviously very weathered. Uh, and we know the sea levels changed dramatically. I mean, you can find seashells up at the top of the Topanga Canyon, Santa Monica Mountains. So at some point, the water was way higher and 
course, we know lower too. It does fluctuate with each ice age, I guess. I don't know. I'm not a geology expert by any means. But you said there was the, the thing that uh, confirmed it for you was the um, what the singer or the, the writer of the Wipeout song kind of. Yeah, Meryl Finkhauser talked to a Chumash native elder. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, wow. Yeah, you know. the, th the thing that cinched it for me is that Google Google raised it. That's that cinched <laughs> yeah. it for me. That, that, that tells me that somebody, somebody in the intelligence community doesn't yep. want the uh, you know normal people seeing that. So it means it's real, whatever it is. I was kind and of one, you know, I was mapping all the sightings out of USOs and UFOs, and they were clustered black over this thing. <laughs> I wonder if there's something in this area. And that was before I even knew about it. I'd heard of it. I'm like, oh. Uh, and someone did tell me that there was actually tunnels that lead from, let's see, Edwards Air Force Base out to this Catalina Channel there. There's tunnels Which, from Edwards Air Force Base to this thing? This, I've had two or three reports. There's one guy who's kind of your typical whistleblower. Mm -hmm. He said that. Now, I can't confirm that in any right. capacity. But I thought it was interesting because it came up more than once. And that is where, you know, oh gosh, what's the name of it? Uh, well, there's San Clemente Island where they do the naval seals, uh, which is just beyond Catalina Island. And then there's the port, that's at Port Wainimi Naval Base is right at the north end of all of that. Uh, I, I mentioned Seal Beach Naval Weapons mm -hmm. Station. That's the south end. I mean, this place is heavily militarized. Uh, we know they know about the USO activity because <laughs> they've been asked directly from MUFON researchers. Uh, so, yeah, we're aware of the rumors of an ET base, and they're not true, and we know nothing. And I've talked to, you know, one guy was a submarine navigator who had an encounter. He contacted me. Uh, he had an encounter in that area. So that was a really interesting interview, to say the least. But another guy was an officer on the USS Long Beach who had an encounter on the far side of Catalina Island that completely put that ship on red alert. Uh, so he was another good witness. And they're like, you know, we don't know what it is. And there's a bunch of cases where these objects are being basically chased by jets, almost 10, up to 20%. It's clear the military does not know what these are. And for that matter, the cases go back to the 1920s, earlier, well before we had any, presumably <laughs> anything uh, that could fly like, you know, these craft are being described as stopping on a dime and going in and out of the water and doing all kinds of things we certainly officially can't do. Random question for you, since we're still on this topic. Have you heard any stories about Lake Tanganyika? And there being a possible USO USO base there. No. All right. So the reason here's the reason I ask. Two weeks ago on this station, I interviewed Lynn Buchanan, and we were talking about kind of the four famous ET bases that he, Pat Price, Joe McMonagall, and others saw in remote viewing. So it was like Mount Hayes in Alaska, uh, Mount Perdido in Spain, Mount Zeal in Australia, and then there was another one in Zimbabwe. And then he said, he kind of said, oh yeah. And then I said, well, what was the name of the one in Africa, in, in Zimbabwe? And he's like, oh, was it Tanganyika? He's like, oh. And his face kind of went white. And then 30 minutes later, somebody knocked on his door. And so he had to get up in the middle of the interview. And it was somebody who came to his house at like, you know, 9, 10 p.m. his local time. You know, All so right. pitch black. And they were saying, do you need your, you know, asphalt? redone right have you ever tried to look at asphalt without any illumination and you know he's like you have cracks in your asphalt <laughs> <laughs> so, all right then <laughs> so so uh anyway he uh you know he, i don't think he was supposed to say that i mean it could just be somebody was going around from house to house legitimately asking about fixing asphalt but i don't know uh anyway <laughs> that's just something something to look and, and by the way i looked into prior sightings and there's a ton of, well, not a ton, but I found at least two in the 1950s that were around Lake Tanganyika. And I think the implication is that there's, again, I don't know, I, I I, I'm inferring, I'm, in, you know, I'm inferring from uh, contextual clues 
So what I'm saying could be completely wrong. But if we had a treaty with somebody, that's where one of them might be. I think it's the longest lake in the world. Well, I can tell you, you could, you know, and I challenge you to do this if you want. Take your hand randomly, your finger, and spin the globe, and I, I can find a sighting there. Hands down, <laughs> within 50 miles of it. That's how active, you know, yeah. UFO activity is on this planet. There's not a location on this planet that doesn't have some history of encounters. Okay. All right. Now, I'll, uh, I, I, I derailed us. Now I'm going to put us back on the track. <laughs> which is we talked about grays now let's talk about uh human human like ets and you know start with some of the particular characteristics that those type of encounters have and then uh you know where they might be from yeah well i wish i knew they where they were from again that's why this field needs a lot more research than it's getting uh but People call them Nordics. I kind of moved off from that terminology because it's not accurate. And it's a little bit <laughs> prejudice even because uh, mm -hmm. they're not always white skinned. Yeah, there's often some blonde hair, blue eyed, human looking descriptions. But I, right off the bat, I started getting ones of all different, you know, ethnicities, I guess would be the best way to put it. Ancestries, call it what you will. But, uh, for example, one guy I interviewed, Stan Hughes is his name, really good witness, very smart, a Native American. He's an author. Uh, he described how he, he was at the, in the Idaho Panhandle driving at the base of Thunder Mountain one morning. He's got a history of encounters, too. When a silver spherical object landed on the road in front of him, and he sort of started moving into the sort of Oz factor, that you hear about where there's this eerie silence kind of pervades the environment mm -hmm. and almost a, a sleepy feeling but at any rate he was fully awake and the door opens and out steps this he's, he says you know i'm married <laughs> i've got kids but this man was beautiful i'm like okay we'll describe him he said well he was over six feet tall six and a half feet tall broad shoulders very muscular wearing let me see if i can get this right a silver or it's a blue suit with silver boots and dark skin. And I'm like, well, what do you mean dark skin? He says, well, he looked Middle Eastern to me. Mm -hmm. He had, you know, long shoulder length hair, dark eyebrows, very dark eyes, a beautific smile, and just peace and wisdom resonating from him in love, actually. And he felt like he was a long lost relative, he being Native American of the Seneca tribe. They he calls them um, uh, the Woje, which is basically the star people, and believe that they are related relatives, they're progenitors, uh, which is probably true because that does come up in a lot of contactee cases. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, he felt an absolute connection to this man who looked Middle Eastern, uh, but very handsome, and basically held his hand up and sort of gave a palms forward greeting and he, he thought to himself to the et actually take me with you i want to go with you at which point the man's smile kind of dropped and he turned around and went back into this thing there was no door just an opened and then it closed and mm -hmm. it took off so it was a pretty brief meeting overall less than five minutes closer to probably to one or two and he, as, as soon as it went he broke down crying just there on the road crying over a steering wheel. I, I brought him to my home several times, and did face-to-face -face interviews and still in touch with him. He's a great guy. Uh, and he, he weeps pretty much every time he tells the story. I mean, he will at least get teary-eyed, but if I make him dig into it, he, yeah, it's very emotional for him. Did he get the sense for what the motivation of this yeah. visit was? He said it was purely a hello. That was his sense. Hmm just a connection like we know about you we're watching over you you're good that sort of thing well preston how come you and i don't you and i don't get hellos well you might have heard <laughs> hello, but I don't get hellos yeah well i don't know it's hard to say i did have a missing time encounter i've had a, some very close up sightings it's accelerated from there gonna have to write a book sean because 
no, I'm, I'm in it neck deep. Well, over my head, I should say I'm in it. <laughs> so I've gotten the hello, which is really awesome. Uh, say, 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 say some more. I, I think you, you may have told me about this, but let's just for the audience, you can't say that and then not, not oh, say what the hello was. Everyone's sitting on pins and needles right now. They want to know. Oh gosh. All right. If you hey, can, if you can, if you can, I don't want to. No, I mean, I, I, I don't have any problem talking about it because you know, it started out slowly for me. I was very reluctant to say that, you know, I'm involved in this. I'm just a researcher. I'm stepping back. I'm objective, right? Because I don't want to lose that. And because mm -hmm. people look upon, they frown upon that a little bit. I'm not so sure that's the right way to do it. Because if you really want to know it, you got to experience it. Uh, you know, like Margaret Mead, I think it was she who said, you know, you become a part of, of who you're studying. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's absolutely well, true. Real quick, before you finish, I have to say this. So you're watching or listening to Through a Glass Darkly Radio on United Public Radio. Thank you very much. And one thing I want to put a pin in because I want to acknowledge this. Thank you, Chester, for the super thanks. When we when we get through this, your experience or when you after you finish discussing your experience, Preston, um, if we could share your thoughts on the Chris Bledsoe case, but put a pin in it and we'll get right back to that. Anyway, yeah. I, this is very personal, so I I don't. <laughs> I do not want to diminish it. I, I very much want to hear what you're. Um, yeah, well, I'm not sh sure how far to go, but I mean, because I could talk for quite a bit on my own personal experiences, which, like as I said, I had an orb come down, and had missing time, which was followed by another sighting where a UFO actually spoke to me <laughs> and did say hello. I mean, it flat out said, "Hi, it's us." You know, that, how recently? How recently was that? That was 1994. Okay. So that that was a while back, but that was when I was interviewing that my third case of Grays with Wendy, I call her. And she had lashed out and kicked a gray in the neck and had hybrid babies and was describing all this stuff. I'm like, is this lady for real? Because I'm transcribing. Oh, this is the, the lady that like killed a gray by breaking its neck, right? Right. Yeah, she thought she for... did. And okay. well, at least uh, I was trans uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, in brief, she saw them around her bed and jumped up and kicked it in the neck. And that stopped the experience from them taking her, at least for that time. Right. Uh, but yeah, I was describing hybrid babies and the whole, I and mean, this was a full on case as pretty much extensive as they get. So I was like kind of scratching my head about it thinking, I know she's for real, but I can't quite wrap my head around this. What's going on? Yeah, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to take in. It was for someone who was pretty new to it. I mean, I was five years in, but still, it was new to me. <laughs> uh, but that's when I got this very strong impulse to go under the roof of my condo. Uncontrollable, strong impulse. I mean, I was up there before I even knew what I was doing. And grabbing my glasses, by the way, which I don't need for driving. You know, I'm just slightly nearsighted. And we'll use them for driving at night, usually. I actually ran down three stories to get them out of my car. <laughs> ran back up. And onto the roof of the condo. And while I wasn't up there, maybe 20 seconds, probably closer to 10, when this UFO appeared right across, you know, there was a parking lot, the little LA River, and then the other street. So mm -hmm. a couple hundred feet away, but it was a giant orange oval, uh, probably 20 feet across, 10, 20 feet, right above the apartment building across the way. <laughs> and it blasted me with a message and it said, hello. I know I got my hello. And they said, we're Wendy's ETs. We're for real. She's telling the truth. If you don't believe, well, watch. We'll prove it. And it wasn't in English. You know, it wasn't sequential words. It was bam. All at once in one second, that message came. Very clear. I, I'll say that. <laughs> I mean, there was no, I, no, you know, misunderstanding that at all. I understood exactly what they were saying. And then they did it. They went back and forth, back and forth, you know, stopping starting, stopping, starting, getting lower and lower so I could see that it was how close it was. You know, this wasn't distant. It went below the trees. So that's how low it was. And then it winked out. So that was one of my first hellos, but it progressed from that. I mean, I'm having dreams of being on board and seeing babies that don't quite look normal. And um, hmm. well, I mean, one time they came down over the freaking freeway <laughs> i'm driving down the 405 freeway 
well, up actually, north from San Diego. I'd visited a friend and uh, was going back to LA. I'm like, what the hell is that over the freeway ahead of me? Mind you, there's, this is at night, and that 405 freeway is one of the worst in the world. It's mm -hmm. never empty. Mm -hmm. and we're whizzing along. You know, everyone drives at 70 miles an hour on that thing. And I was. But I slowed down as this, I'm coming over this thing, because I know the freeway well enough. I've done this trip 100 times. And there's this giant globe <laughs> over the freeway. It was a low cloud cover, maybe uh, a few hundred feet, maybe upwards of a 1,000, but I don't think so. I'm looking at this thing. Oh, I'm like, that's not a building. There's no way that's a street light. It's a huge white yellow globe of light, maybe mm -hmm. 100, 200 feet up, right over the freeway. And, you know, I didn't stop. I don't know why I didn't pull her stop and, you know, freak out because you don't expect it, right? And you're booking along. Yeah, and as yeah. I'm getting these right, things always these strange things always happen when you last expect them. It's, yeah, yeah. But as I'm going right under it, I'm like, well, okay, well, because it was a little hazy, and I'm like, well, I'm going to see something attached to it. There's got to be an explanation, but there wasn't. There was nothing attached to it. There was no explanation. It was totally silent. Of course, you know, you're in the freeway, and it's pretty noisy. There were cars around me. <laughs> no one's paying any attention to this thing, and. You would. I mean, if you saw this, you would pay attention to it because it was big and it was right over the fucking, excuse me, yeah. the frickin' <laughs> freeway. FCC is going to get you. Gonna, I think we're I think we're allowed to do that. I, I just, I'm over, over cautious. About I rarely that. swear, but so uh, this one got me. Uh, That's okay. That's just okay. not a swear, but <laughs> this one got to me because as I came right under it, I knew it was unusual. And that's when I got a message. And again, it wasn't words. You know, but it was very clear that my niece was born, <laughs> that my niece had been born. Oh, wow. Uh, now, I knew my sister-in-law was pregnant, but I wasn't thinking about it at the time. I knew she was close to the due date. I didn't know the due date. Uh, but I'll never forget that day, July 9th. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, I went home. I'm like, well, gosh, you know, I'm going to certainly call her up. And find out. She's, of course, the one who did see the greys. <laughs> so maybe there's a connection there. My sister, what, of course, also. What year was that? Sorry, what year was the, the freeway thing? Gosh, I, I wrote it down. I have to pin it down. July 9th. We know it's July 9th. We just July 9th, the year 19... I don't know. So we're still 20th. Uh, we're still 1998. Still 20th century. We're still 20th century. On that. 98, 99 around, around okay. there. And by the way, like that's kind of there's tons of reports like that where somebody will see something and nobody else around them will. Like that's the Ray Hernandez case is very similar, right? Okay, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow because you were, you know, this is fascinating stuff. And the less I talk, yeah, but I mean, it, it went on from there. I mean, I'm reluctant to talk about some of it because I want to kind of write about it, <laughs> you know. But I did at one point okay. have a fully conscious onboard experience, so. Which okay. Was very brief. But. Let's let's see if there's without because you do need to preserve that so you can write a book about it. But when you write this book, any like snapshot that you can share, like grays, is the inside bigger than the outside? Is like just. Very I'll tiny. tell you, it was the best experience ever. You know, and I knew it was happening. It was on my birthday. And I find myself hurtling through the sky. I'm like, well, I'm being taken and it's finally happening. And I am ready to leave Earth forever. <laughs> I don't want to come back. This is happening. I'm fully awake. Uh, this is out of my home in Reseda, 2021. Not too long ago. I mean, this is fairly recent for me. And I found myself in a craft laying on the proverbial table with. Uh, well, a hybrid hum human-looking lady with big, weird-looking eyes, but a beautiful blonde woman, but not fully human. I mean, you could tell her face was not fully human. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were so worried about me. They're like, are you okay? Are you okay? And, and I'm fine. You know, I've had out-of-body experiences, and I've felt that vibrations and done interdimensional travel, I guess, and, so uh, did this feel like a fully physical experience or was there like a, you feel you were in like a subtle body, you were in like an astral body? Um, 
I was a little confused at first, but ultimately it felt, I mean, it felt physical. Yeah, you know, it's just hard to wrap your head around that you're actually physically on there. But, um, well, just moving along, because some, you know, it wasn't a super long experience, five or 10 minutes, but I saw a tall gray. <laughs> Uh, well, real quick, did you get a chance to fly the machine? No, I sure didn't. No. Okay, all right, I'll stop. Okay, go continue. <laughs> I just had, I had to ask that. Um, but I met a tall gray, and she looked down at me, and she's like, "So, is it what you thought it would be?" I said, "Actually, it's much better." You know, can I go exploring? <laughs> can I walk around? Like, go, you know, go ahead. And it was just this. You know, you can probably see how far away the bookcases are. You know, yeah. 15 20 feet yeah. it was not much bigger than it was like a very large room you know not a gymnasium or anything but house sized and all you know the typical rounded walls there was banks of windows all around and oh it was so much fun there were people there some were lined up kind of in rows and a little bit dazed i mean not a little bit they were out of it I walked up to them, like, isn't this cool? Isn't this great? And they're like, dee, 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 dee. and others were fully conscious and just having a great time. There were some very alien looking dudes kind of standing guard and being very unemotional. And yeah, it was the most awesome. I, I had drank the alien drink, but yeah, I'll, I'll go more into it at some point. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I'm not gonna. I'm not that's gonna, that's how it ended. They're, they're like, we want you to drink this, and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. Like the ambrosia, the the you know the nectar of the gods. It's funny because I've read about you know I did a whole thing in one of my not from here books, alien drinks, because people describe these as you know neon pink or green or bitter or juice, you know, kind of fruity and all these different descriptions, right? And they hand me this thick glass tumbler yay big not not a giant beer mug or anything and it had it was about half filled with this kind of pinkish liquid and i'm looking at it, i'm like huh okay or no wait let me think was it it was greenish i'm sorry not pink it was green and i'm like okay and i sniffed it and i'm like very subtle and so i drank it and it was thick it was twice as thick as water not as thick as pancake syrup but like a smoothie but Liquid, definitely liquid syrupy i guess would be the way of putting it and it tasted like kiwi lime very subtle slightly sweet and i took one sip and they took the glass away i'm like wait no can't i have another sip and they looked at me with absolute astonishment like really <laughs> you sure I'm like well yeah i mean i, I just want to taste it and they allowed it but apparently this was not something people normally do. <laughs> did they, I mean, did they the... tell you what the purpose of bringing you up there just to like say hello or to give you more comfort? Um, I or... think it was a birthday present, honestly. I had been asking and asking and asking. And there's, I mean, I've got more I want to talk about at some point Yeah, about all of that. So I will you spill the that book. You got to write that book, Preston, like immediately. Yeah. I mean, it was the best thing ever. I can't tell you. <laughs> to be in this field for that long and finally get to see something you know, so fully conscious. Because I've had dream well, recall of fully being on board. Because now, you know. now you know. It's not like you're percent. listening to other people's stories and right, and you believe them, but you don't really, you don't know for yourself. Yeah, and you get this first, you know, you, you get this certain, you visualize when people say, oh, the walls, walls are rounded. I'm always thinking, you know, it's round like an egg. No, they're straight walls, but they come down at a curve like that. Mm. Yeah. it was just the coolest thing ever i mean i lucked out on this one i'm so it was the best experience ever i'll never forget it i woke up in bed like oh my god <laughs> this is unbelievable and then okay so the chris bledsoe question i need to go back to that what, what do you make of that case yeah well i'm I uh, kind of knew about Chris Bledsoe for a while because he's kind of popped onto the scene uh, when he went public. And I'm like, wow, this sounds like an interesting case. And I met him at UFO Con in Sacramento, I think it was, and made it a deliberate effort to you know, meet with him because he had a healing case, which I studied. He was healed of Crohn's disease. And I found that really compelling because he was out camping, had 
know, his friends there, his son, they all saw UFOs. He had missing time. They all saw greys. I mean, this was a very well-documented multi-witness case. And Chris Bledsoe was basically wheelchair bound and was cured of Crohn's pretty much overnight. I mean, by that experience, no longer needed medication. It's a very well-documented healing. One of the best out there, certainly mm -hmm. in the top 20, I would say. And meeting with him in person, I'm like, you're in my book. <laughs> would you like a copy? And uh, he's like, oh, wow, that's really nice of you. And he was a really kind, very sincere gentleman. And I have no doubt that he's having experiences. I mean, certainly fits the profile. I can't, I have not vetted his case in the way I personally investigate people. But yeah, I'm a supporter of it. I find it interesting. He's blending a lot of religious and spiritual elements to his case, which is not that unusual, but he's farther along on the bell curve for your typical encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think he's legit. I really do. Okay. So we're still on human like encounters. What other things, you know, have you noticed about or similarities that people typically have? Um, well, uh, people will always describe the eyes as being particularly hypnotic and very mesmerizing, usually a little larger than normal. They're almost always described as being genetically flawless, I mean, beautiful. One guy I interviewed who was healed, actually, and he's a good witness. I mean, he's a reverend. Or you may have heard of Michael Carter. He's yep. fairly well known in the field. He's an author. But we've become, you know, colleagues, if not friends. And he described his healing of a blood clot by a, a typical Nordic-looking human. I call them human-looking, but his was Nordic yeah, in appearance. Yeah, like somebody from Scandinavia, basically. Yeah. Very tall, blonde hair, blue eyes, extremely wise and friendly. The descriptions you get. Uh, wearing a jumpsuit, so fairly typical. Another guy I interviewed who had a load of experiences would only share the one that took place at Leo Carrillo Beach. It's like, you know, I'll give you this because you're researching this area. But mm -hmm. I want you to know I do have a lifetime of this and it would take days and days to share it all. But I'll share this case with you. He was at a party with a lot of people, by the way, on Leo Carrillo Beach, which is sort of north of Malibu. And it's off the Pacific Coast Highway. There's a little wooden staircase that goes down. And it's a fairly large beach with lifeguard towers and the whole deal. It was an impromptu, impromptu evening party with about 50 people or more. And at some point, people noticed lights out in the water, big, bright lights floating on the water some distance out there. And he was out there, walked up, and there was a, they were all kind of standing in a row watching these when one of the lights detached and raced far faster than it could to the right. And next thing they know, they all turn around because everyone's ooing and eyeing because there's this enormous bright stadium light shining down from the top of the parking lot there mm -hmm. down towards the beach. And everyone kind of goes into a complete trance or daze or hypnotic trance when 10 or so human figures, human looking, wearing blue jumpsuits, start walking down the stairs and walking among the people. And his first impression was they were carrying books, but later he started having flashbacks of these were some sort of technological iPad kind of device. <laughs> and they're walking among everybody and no one is paying any attention to them at all. And he's like awake and unmoving and not really able to respond. But he said that they were five, and a, five feet tall, short, all had the same hair, short brown hair. They were male and female. They all looked like brothers and sisters, almost identical, which is something you hear. But mm -hmm. one climbed up to the top of the life tower. tower. He's like, I don't know how he did that. They're fenced off. There's no way you can really get up there easily at all. But he looked up and one of them was on top, signaling to the lights out there uh, in the water, which are apparently are still there. So he's watching all this and looking at everyone who's dazed and they're just walking among them in a weird way. They're paired off and 
So what the motivation is, I have no idea. Uh, he had some memories of being on board following this because they did have missing time. The next thing he knows, he's standing on the beach with about 10 of the people in a row. And there's these weird marks around each one of them. And it ended the party. Everyone went home. Nobody talked about it. It was what year not was remembered. This? this was 97, if I have that correctly. Okay. It's in, it's in By my the way, book. thank you, Bruno. I, thank you very much, Bruno, for the uh, super thanks. But but yeah, it was a super interesting encounter, and he started. You know, he he spontaneously remembered it like a few days after. He's like, "Oh my gosh, you know, I'm remembering this. I must be losing my mind because this. How can this happen? There's so many people there, and he didn't know all of them, but he knew enough. And he started asking everybody, and they're like, "What are you talking about? No, no people came down." And some are like, well, yeah, I remember seeing the lights in the water. Is that what you're talking about? And he's like, well, yeah. And one person had some memory of somebody coming down the stairs. That's it. He was really the only one who remembered to the, that he could find. Remember these, these figures walking among them. But those are human-looking ETs. He said they looked Mesoamerican to him. Not dark, dark skin, but sort of Peruvian, Mexican. Uh, some along those lines, very, you know, sort of plain looking, but in a, you know, genetically very organized features. No, you know, anything that looked, you know, abnormal in any way, but very. Why do you think, why do you think that is? Do you think that's because they're all biological clones and they're just designed to have whatever the golden ratio uh, in terms of facial features and body features? i.e. perfect features or what do you think drives that or is that a glamour it. is that a glamour that they use um yeah i don't i'm not willing to say that this is a screen memory or an illusion or anything uh, something that they're hypnotically putting over people because it's so consistent mm -hmm. um, i think this is probably this is just my assessment mind you because i can only speculate that um based on what people report to me uh, it's very consistent, and I don't know why they're described that way other than they've overcome the problems that we have in terms of, you know, hair lips or <laughs> scars or anything that might cause facial abnormalities or deformities or what we would perceive as not the optimum type of beauty, I guess. But mm -hmm. certainly people describe them as being very handsome and very beautiful, whether, you know, female or male. So it's very, very consistent in that regard. And I, I suspect that they just have good genetics and take very good care of their genetics. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really couldn't well, tell maybe you. Maybe they're not as, they have better ways of uh, protecting themselves from. Yeah. Well, you know, I should say that radiation. it's not always true, too, because there was a guy I interviewed from Canada who had an encounter at Wasaga Beach. Uh, which is, you know, a very popular tourist destination along Lake Ontario. And he oh, yeah. Yeah, took yeah, an yeah, impromptu walk with his friends. He's like, oh, let's take a walk, let's take a walk. And they're like, no, no, what are you doing? It's late. He's like, come on, let's just do it. He felt this impulse, which is, and he's had been doing CE5s vigorously, <laughs> really wanted to make contact and had. And this was that pattern, you know, people will have a close-up sighting and then it escalates. And this is exactly what happened with him. He's walking with four friends, and suddenly they stop in lockstep, foot in the air. The, the moon looks real big. You know, the silence comes over. The waves kind of flatten. It's the Oz factor in full force. And he's like, guys, <laughs> what's wrong? Why aren't you moving? Hello, hello, hello. Uh, and they had all just noticed some people down by the beach that looked really unusual. And he turns and he's looking at them. God, they look tall. And next thing he knows, boom, probably missing time. But he's in front of them now, mm -hmm. face to face. And they are, he said they were at least 12 feet tall, probably closer to 15. And we talked about this for a while. I was like, listen, I'm six and I think he said four inches tall. Don't, he says, you better not use my name. <laughs> I will kill you if you use my name. I'm like, I'm not going to use your name, I promise. You know, but he's a businessman, a philanthropist, very successful, quite young. 
uh, and uh, very spiritually minded, all into you know the pyramids of Egypt and philosophy and Eastern thought and meditation. But standing in front of these guys, frightened because they are very tall. They're wearing black jumpsuits. They're human looking, but not because they're they they're well they're huge for one thing, but they're chins are jutting and their foreheads are massive and they've got big, big eyes that are slightly wrapped around. He said they had the green irises with gold lined green irises, different and jagged teeth, not, not good. And the skin was very thick and wrinkly and not particularly attractive. You know, not what we would think of as your typical human looking, but basically human looking. And he's like, you're not supposed to be here. Uh, you know, he doesn't he know why. To these, to these you know, giants, you're not basically. supposed to be here. Right. Uh, he thinks they showed up because he was calling out to them. He wanted to see an ET. And they told him, well, we can come and go as we want to. In chorus, in a thick, gravelly voice, which he's not sure if it was telepathic or not, but he's leaning towards not. But it was in chorus, which is interesting because I hear that occasionally from witnesses. But yeah, he was right next to them and had to look up like that. And he's he's a tall dude. But those are so you get to this point where like, gosh, you know, well, humanoid, but are they human looking? Yeah, I mean, look, there's trillions of galaxies, right? So like, you would have to expect that there to be, God knows how many different civilizations out there. So yeah, you know, but I can say that you're not going to see all the contactees. By and large, if you have any start regular communication back and forth, you're going to get the message at one point, like we share a common heritage. <laughs> no, we're not that different. We come from the same place. Uh, you are us. We are you. We are one. It's some variation of that. Uh, and, if, and I read about it too in other cases. I'm like, well, there it is again. You know, Barbara Lamb has cases like this, John Mack, the researchers I, who I really respect. And they're the ones who dive into the onboard experiences more than, you know, perhaps other because there's i mean there's all kinds of niche explorations and researching you can do on the subject but i love the first-hand contact t cases and especially when someone's taken on board or meeting ets face to face and getting communication with them and that comes up so much and they're always now, humanoid almost always how, humanoid how are these cases or how have they been in the last I don't know, two to three years. Are the cases kind of of contactees picking up, slowing down? Have they gone away altogether? Um, well, for, I can tell you from my own personal experience, I don't have any over the past two years. I have oh, one, I should say, which came from a guy in England. I call him Gary, who's had contacts with greys and human looking beings and he did have he says this was last early last year uh that he had a gray which i suspect is one of those little ai grays the three foot tall non-emotional very short uh little tiny which i think are ai grays that's really the only one so yeah severe drop off right off a cliff drop off which kind of fits what Dolly Saffron keeps telling me and keeps repeating over and over again that, listen, guys, they're not here right now. Our magnetic fields of our planet are collapsing. We're facing an existential crisis. And as scary and weird as that sounds, there's good science to back this up if you, you know, start researching that. And it's a very common message from contactees that we're facing a very uncertain future. <laughs> Get ready, guys, which I think you know, speaks to the fact that many contactees are very concerned about the environment, have moved off grid, are saving food and water, are worried about a social, you know, economic, socioeconomic collapse. Uh, so that could be what's going on here. Certainly in my own files, I'm not, I'm just not getting them. And initially I'm thinking, well, you know, it takes people a year or two, sometimes 10, 20 years to even find the courage to come forward to talk about this. People have missing time too, they don't remember. So there's a number of factors that take, it's a long road to finding someone to talk to for a lot of people. 
And I, I, I was putting, like, well, maybe that's what's going on here. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, there is a drop off. And you can see this. If you go to the files of New Fork and MUFON, you'll find lots of little white lights and orbs and people describing all kinds of things that could be anything. But in terms of humanoids, you know, and onboard experiences, and the people, you know, because I'm in contact with people who are regular experiencers. And they hear this and like, well, you know, it's true. I haven't had a, anything in two years now. I'm like, well, okay. So that is where I'm at right now. That's my assessment. Okay. Now, in terms of, uh, let's go to the, the the mantis or the mantids or whatever you want to call ah, them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's let's <laughs> talk through kind of the common scenarios you see them in, and you know, from your case files. Yeah, I interviewed one lady, actually went to speak for her MUFON group in Thousand Oaks. Jeannie is her name. And she's like, well, if you want, you know, you can interview me. I saw mantids. I'm like, okay, <laughs> tell me what happened. And she kind of came to a sudden awareness of her encounters when she was having all these dreams about UFOs and telepathic communications. And I remember like what waking up in a quasi sleep state and ETs are talking to her, and she perceived that they were little grays, but she couldn't really see them. And then one day, she wakes up in the middle of the night in the bathroom and spontaneously recalls that she had just had an encounter with a nine-foot-tall, kind of grasshoppery, <laughs> praying mantis-looking being, which was basically putting an instrument of some kind down her throat mm -hmm. in an unpleasant procedure. Uh, and she described it in detail as looking very much like, you know, a mantid bug, very much like we see here on Earth. That was one of my first cases. Her recall is pretty sketchy. She doesn't really remember a whole lot of going on board or anything like this. She does have the idea that someday the sky is going to fill with craft, and it's her job to help scoop people up and put them on board, <laughs> which is something a lot of contactees say. But certainly an interesting case that stretches all the way back through childhood with you know, grays coming in. It's not unusual for people to report grays and mantids and human looking, you know, at various times or together. That was one of my earlier mantid cases. Probably my favorite was Kevin Kamen, who passed away, sadly, about two years ago. But I liked his story because, you know, I went to speak down in San Diego and he was in the audience and I'm talking about a mantid case and I'm putting up some of the drawings and he came up to me, six foot tall, Navy medic. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you know, that's not what they look like to me, but it's darn close. I'm like, oh, well, you know, what happened to you? And he described an experience where he was on a Navy ship and his bunkmate, well, I'll, I'll call him Lewis, that's not his name, said, you know, I'm a contactee. <laughs> they take me to their planet. They've been on their ship. I've been visiting them since childhood. And Kevin's like, oh, yeah, sure you are. If you, you're you truly a contactee. I want to meet your little green friends. And Lewis is like, okay, I'll arrange it. And comes back a week later and says, well, they took me to your house. <laughs> I saw the orange shag rug and the milk stain, you know, the milkshake stain on your Camaro or whatever it was. And he describes Kevin's house in detail. Mind you, they're on a ship out in the Mediterranean or, you know, actually the Pacific, the sort of the Bermuda Triangle area, but not really. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. So Kevin's freaking out. He's like, did this guy go on shore leave? Obviously he didn't. Uh, so he's like, well, how did you know that? And I'm like, I told you. <laughs> they took me to your house. He says, but you're describing my house as it was 10 years ago. He's like, oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so it was doubly confusing for him. And it was, he said, but he says, you know what? They, they agreed to take you. They're going to come, you know, in a couple of days. I'll let you know when. And he comes up into the bunk one morning and says, okay, you know, it's your break time, right? And he's like, yeah. Kevin's like, yeah, I'm about to have lunch. He says, well, they're up on deck. You'll see them. And he goes up on deck thinking this guy is full of it because it's, it's high noon. <laughs> you know, this is a 600 foot Navy ship with, you know, hundred people on it. And sure enough, goes up on deck and there's this giant <laughs> UFO, which was sparkling with these colored lights, it was bigger, than three times bigger than the ship, he said, and off, quarter mile, half mile to the side. 
and he does whatever, you know, what I always tell everyone to do. If you see something like this, get another witness, get another witness. And he runs up to Tony the mess cook and cannot get his attention. Can't get anyone's attention. And next thing he knows, he's looking down at his Navy ship and it's receding into the distance. And long story short, I mean, this was a prolonged encounter, fully conscious. But he started talking to them mentally. He couldn't, he refused to turn around. He was too scared. He's like, I'm AWOL. They're like, no, you're not. No one even knows you're gone. And he asked him all these questions. Where are you from? And they showed him a star chart and gave him the name of some star, which he can't pronounce. Uh, he tried. He just, it was just a meaningless word. And he's like, are you going to eat me? And they said, no, we eat you know, fish and fruit and vegetables. You watch a lot of horror movies, don't you? <laughs> so it was very a human conversation. He said, are you for real? And he's like, hey, yeah, we're for real. He's like, is Roswell real? And I said, yes. And they gave him all these predictions that said they warned him about nuclear uh, bombs. Basically said, since we started using nuclear material and exploding bombs, it's caused all these things to happen. He showed him all these hurricanes in full color. He says it was like looking out a window. So it's a long, prolonged encounter. Quite a bit happened, but at some point he finally turns around. He's asking, what do you look like? And they said, well, we're not little and we're not green, if, you know, if that's what you think. But our, our appearance can be frightening, just so you know. And, and he turns around and he was very frightened because they were 15-foot tall praying mantis, bone white, enormous triangular heads, eyes the size of basketballs, oozing you know, superior intelligence in a way. They told him that. You know, they said, basically, we know everything about you. <laughs> we can speak every language on this planet. You know, would you like to go to our planet? And he said, no. And Why do you there, say there was, no? The he said no. Yes. yes. Yeah. He says, Preston, you don't understand. I'm like, because well, I that's what I said. I'm like, how could you say no? This is an incredible opportunity. He says, yeah, well, you'd think so. But when you're standing there, shaking in your boots, he says, I nearly crapped my pants. I was, I felt like a bug next to them. They were very big. <laughs> I felt very vulnerable. And uh, he said they were completely friendly, but he was shook up. And he says, one of them walked, the room would change size, by the way. And I, he, hmm. he kind of looked at me when I asked him, how big is the room? <laughs> he gave me this look like, I don't know how to tell you this, but it changed size. I'm like, okay, you know, this is a good detail. This is one of those little, not super well-known things, certainly among the general public, that can help you to confirm a person's story. But he being a Navy medic, you know, I talked to his wife, talked to his brother. I do I do my due diligence, you know, I verified his employment. So at any rate, he says one of these guys stood up, it was sitting on what looked like a sort of a stone chair mm -hmm. on a dais, stood up and took about two or three steps, you know, which, which is about 10, you know, six to 10 foot strides right up to him and put it. And, and that's when he asked him, do you want to go to our planet? And he said, no. And he said, okay, we'll take you back and put its claw. He said, it had a kind of a claw on his shoulder. And he stiffened and screamed bloody murder. And that's the last he remembers. He woke was it, up. Was it hurt or? No, he was just frightened. He was just purely mm -hmm. frightened. He says, you know, you got to forgive me. I've been through some pretty hairy situations. I'm a tough guy, but you don't know what it's like to have someone that tall standing next to you. I'm like, are you sure they were 15 feet tall? Because usually I hear maybe nine feet, 10, 12. Not really. Usually it's about, you know, six to nine feet. He's like, listen, they were more than twice my height. He's a trained observer. Uh, he said it was like looking up at a basketball uh hoop you know and a half and, and a half right and so i mean he had to look up to him he says that's how tall they were i don't know what to tell you <gasps> you're okay you know i'm not second guessing you i just want to get an accurate description but uh yeah he says as soon as they touched him he's he that was more than he could take and he blacked out and he woke up hyperventilating covered with sweat <laughs> laying down on his bunk which is not where he started from by the way he was on deck and as soon as he's there, the curtains, you know, the curtains were, they have little curtains that go around your bunk. 
they whipped open and there's his friend, uh, Lewis, and he's grinning from ear to ear and so, how did you like your little ride? And he broke up with that guy. He's like, you're not my friend, go away. Uh, he was mad uh, and he regretted that later. Uh, but that was his experience in a nutshell. There was more to it, but that was one of the one account that really impressed me. And another, real quick, yeah, was a, a teacher. We still have from, plenty of time. We still have plenty of time. Yeah, this lady contacted me because she read that in my book, Inside UFOs. It's the first chapter, and uh, she's like, "I'm so glad you put that out there because I don't tell anybody this." <laughs> but I was jogging out in 2001 outside of my home in O'Fallon, Illinois. Tiny little town. I looked it up. I verified every street she listed and you know her whole pathway that she was out jogging early one morning. At, she likes to jog at 4 a.m. with her dog. <laughs> and went down her street, went down another street, and up to the street called Kyle Avenue, which is a T intersection where there is a large street light. And she saw what she thought was a man on stilts walking down the center of Kyle Road. This is a fair, I mean, not a busy street, but there's cars on it during the day. There were none at 4 a.m. And she's like, what the heck? Her dog noticed it first, actually, because she's just jogging along and her dog stopped. She's thinking, oh, it's going to be a deer, you know, or a raccoon or fox, because there was quite a bit of rural terrain around there. Mm -hmm. uh, high school on the left a cornfield on the right that was plowed and uh her dog stops and she looks up and she's like gosh look at that guy <laughs> he looks weird he looks like he's on stilts with extenders on his arms and taking six foot strides and booking it down towards the teener section to the towards the left and she's a hundred feet away or so and it walks right into the street light and that's when she goes oh my god because this thing is not a man, it's a praying mantis. It's 15 feet tall because she saw it against the street light. And it went right under the street light. And she said it was mottled gray, pencil thin, very long stick like limbs, up, you know, front arms up like a sort of puppy dog curled forward, which is how it's often described, moving in sort of jerky movements, little details that I know, but most people wouldn't triangular head, very large black eyes. That was the only real color on it was the black eyes. And it was moving back and forth with its head pointed downwards as if scanning the road, looking for something. And just went right on <laughs> going and she and her dog ran after it <laughs> up to the intersection, <laughs> right? And she saw it turn off the, into the, the corner. The guy field. in the Navy was terrified of these things. She's not. <laughs> <laughs> She's a teacher. You know, She's a daycare worker. <laughs> and ran towards it and uh, went to where it went out into the cornfield and didn't see it, of course. Went mm -hmm. jogging the next day looking for it. And every day after that, you know, it didn't stop her. But th she did not see where it went, never saw a UFO. And I'm like, listen, what's out there? <laughs> Is there anything in this area that might, you know, draw this in there? She's like, there's nothing out there. You know, high school, a cornfield. They put up a water tower there, but I don't believe it was there at the time. Uh, and she said, there is one thing that I thought of. Scott Air Force Base is six miles away. As the yeah, program. there you go. There you go. And she invited a colonel over from Scott Air Force Base to her home. Her, her husband did. And she found herself spilling the story, which surprised her. because She doesn't tell people. She doesn't talk about it. Only her family knows. And, was uh, this the Air Force Office of Special Investigations? <laughs> I, I don't think so. It was just, I don't know. Okay, she that's that. better. That, that's better. If, that, <laughs> if those people show up. No, this was a, a personal invite from a friend who happened to be a colonel at the base. She brought it up. She's like, oh, gosh, why am I saying this? Because he's looking at her. And, and she's like, well, what do you think? And he's like, I, no comment. <laughs> weird things happen around here or he said something along those lines and quickly and awkwardly changed the conversation and she was talking to me like this was a one-off and i dug deep and it turned out no of course it wasn't she did have a full-on visitation as a young kid 
couple of other sightings of not human beings, the whole psychic stuff and another UFO sighting. So it's clear that there was more to it because I wondered about it. If this, she's like, it didn't see me. I'm like, okay, well, maybe you're right. I guess it didn't. I mean, that was her perception. She didn't have missing time. But yeah, what a strange sighting that was. Now, what about where are they from? I don't know. I don't know, Sean. They're, I think it's a populated universe out there. You know, we live on a planet, you know, orbiting a star. And people are all over here in the UFO community are like, well, they're interdimensional beings. <laughs> no, they're not aliens at all. They're wearing masks. They're demonic. They're time travelers from the future. I'm like, yeah, everyone's hold certain. on. <laughs> yeah, everyone's certain, right? Yeah. I mean, Jacques Vallée is a very prominent and popular and certainly knowledgeable researcher who is pushing a theory that these are not ETs mm -hmm. because it's too strange. There's too many of them. And that's basically his argument. <laughs> like, well, he says that they're manifesting in their, you know, manipulating our belief system. They're just pretending because this is our, the zeitgeist that we're in of extraterrestrials being out there. Go well, hold on a second. If this, if they're manifesting and then disappearing, you're saying this is anthropocentric, <laughs> that it's based on us. How are they manifesting? What's the mechanism? What? How do you explain this in any way that makes any sense at all? And he can't. None of these people who are pushing this phenomena or intelligence theory have any mechanism behind it, whereas the extraterrestrial explanation fits so perfectly in there. Yeah, it's strange. But who are we? Are we not living on a planet? We know this. I and mean, we're fairly certain <laughs> that we're biological beings who, yeah, are interdimensional too. Who's not? Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a proponent of the ET theory, having had an experience myself. I'd like to take these people on board, and then they change their tune. Because once you see an ET face to face, you're done. I mean, you know. So, I think that they are from planets. I, I really do. They're from other planets. I haven't been there. I've talked to people who have. Uh, I I find their testimony very compelling. More so as I dig deeper into this. But I see no reason why most of this can't be explained as extraterrestrials from other planets, wherever they want to, you know, people say, well, they're too far away. Yeah, by if you take a rocket, but if you have a, that kind of craft, which is a living being in and of itself, and can travel interdimensionally, and can basically hit any point in the known galaxy or beyond for that matter, and go through what, well, what Dolly Saffron calls a light gate, you can travel immense distances instantly. There's no reason why these can't be ET. And that's what the evidence is showing us because people are taken on board and they're not in their rooms. And these things are landing and they're glassifying the ground at 3000 degrees. And these darn things show up on radar. And if you believe the whistleblower accounts, and I think we should, because there's a lot of them, they're very consistent. Uh, we have these craft. They are being reverse engineered, and the bodies are, you know, being held in various bases across the U.S. and the world. People have implants in their bodies for Pete's sake. <laughs> Is a, a weird interdimensional intelligence doing that? And furthermore, let's look at the behavior of these beings hovering over military bases, warning us about nuclear proliferation, hovering over mines, you know, doing. What amounts to a, clearly a survey? Hydroelectric dams. Uh, they show a great interest in anything technological. That does not sound demonic to me. It does not sound like a spiritual intelligence. This sounds like someone like us. What we would do. My assessment. Now you have kind of the first three. What other type? Well, actually, I have a very specific question about this. So the Pescagoula incident the ets that were described there i don't think have ever been as far as i know have ever been described like that before or since they're very unique is that accurate i think those were probably suits honestly mm -hmm. 
uh, because you know Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker did describe other experiences where they had fingers and you know, were more humanoid. Uh, so I suspect, you know, I don't know. That is definitely unique. I think there was another lady in the area who had an onboard experience, but just described it in similar terms. But there are you know, people describe some of these guys wearing fishbowl helmets and others have none at all. Mm -hmm. you know, diver suits are very common or jumpsuits. That's the most popular fashion statement galaxy wise <laughs> it's these little tight skin tight you know tan silver black or blue jumpsuits usually and sometimes gold you know rarely red <laughs> does turn up but uh yeah i mean i don't know it's hard to say because there is an element of uniqueness to each encounter uh, 80 percent 90 percent are usually details i've heard a hundred times. I mean, I've had people describe nothing new. <laughs> every single thing they say I've heard before, from the, you know, everything on board to the tools to the behavior to the chairs, the walls, the words said, <laughs> the sequence of events. Um, nothing new. But usually, people will describe some some detail that's a little different, and that often is the description of the ETs whether it's their height or the clothes they wear or the placement of their eyes. Uh, there's an element of that there for sure. But yeah, grays are most common, but you have huge variation in that. Some people say, well, they weren't really gray. <laughs> they were much more kind of pink, you know, flesh toned or very much dark gray or darker skinned or white, bone white or yellowish no they had a little bit of a greenish tint <laughs> looked a little blue to me um you know they had a kind of reddish orange look to them um, sometimes i think it might be the lights or your own perception your own belief system plays a role here uh, which is unfortunate but the fact is people aren't generally speaking great observers that's why i love a multi-witness case because you start to see that because <laughs> one person will say this and then and while the most details match some don't mm -hmm. but often you get a bit a more clear view because people will describe stuff that you know could be an element of uh, what do you call it paradelia going on here in a sense that they're not so much paradelia but straight up delusion <laughs> or placing you know stuff that's not there looking through the lens of their belief system can be a powerful factor here because if you're super religious and I've talked to people, they're sure it's a demon. And mm -hmm. I've talked them through it and some are like, you know, maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe it wasn't. And others are like, you know, I'm telling you this thing, it wore a mask. I'm sure of it. I'm like, how are you sure? I'm like, I could just tell. Like, okay. You know, it's not my job to interpret your experience for you. It's my job to try to help you through it and help explain it, answer your questions, maybe provide some clarity and insight, uh, you know, provide you the tools to cope with it, this sort of thing. Uh, but I'm not gonna step all over someone's belief system. It's, you know, that's rude. <laughs> if they feel this way, that's perfectly fine. It's their experience. Yeah, just, but the first that, yeah, plays a role. just get the details and then any interpretation you kind of just have to you can record it, but you can put it to the side, right? Yeah, I will work with people who are like dead scared of what's happening to them. So, you know, let's just step back and let's tell me exactly what they did to you. Why was this so scary? And ultimately, it comes down to a loss of control. They feel like mm -hmm. perhaps they didn't ask for it. Uh, they don't remember the experience in its entirety. So they're like, what happened to me? <laughs> And will this happen again? And how can I control this? And can I have any measure of back and forth with this? And if you work with them and people continue to have encounters, in most cases, they develop a much more interactive, benevolent sort of viewpoint. And I mean, flat out interactions with them. So yeah, I think it's important that people just try to move past fear. That's what I always tell people who are having these encounters. Write everything down. Let's look at exactly what happened to you. Because you're here now. You survived this. You're fine. Um, 
let's dig into your childhood. You know, ask everyone around you, have they had encounters? Let's see what's going on here. Why do you think they are contacting you? And we sort of move forward through this so they can get a better understanding of what's happening to them. Now, what do you make of claims that some contactees, of abductees, wherever, wherever they call themselves in that particular moment, some of them claim that they invoke the name of Jesus and and these you know entities will leave. What do you make of those claims? Um, well, I've looked into it and I interviewed and talked to and been on some panels with people who are absolutely convinced that this is demonic and if you use the name of Jesus, they'll go away. So I went into the files of MoveCon and you can do you know, word searches, basically, buzzwords. And I typed in Jesus, and I typed in demon, and I, you know, and I looked for every single case, and I scoured the literature. I'm like, let's dig deep. I found a lot of cases, people who thought they were angelic, a lot. Mm -hmm. And I found a few cases where people, like, saw a UFO and said, in the name of Jesus, go. And, and the UFO went on its merry way. That, to me, is not good evidence that your statement you know, caused the behavior of that UFO affected in any way. Because maybe it was just going on its way. Now, if someone's on the table and they're like, in the name of Jesus, put me back. And it does. I found a couple of cases. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the fact that there are, you know, probably tens of thousands of these kinds of cases, we're approaching that number. Uh, it's statistically insignificant. It's got to be at least 10% for this to be a good you know what what is called significant and it's mm -hmm. below that now there are researchers out there who dig into this and that's their deal you know they're religious and i am not so sure i entirely trust them because they're looking at it through the lens of their belief system they're very strongly religious and that you do what i call cherry picking and shoe fitting and you throw away the stuff that doesn't fit and frankly if i were to take you know say i'm a doctor and i'm putting someone on the table to examine them and they start losing their minds and say, in the name of Jesus, get the hell away from me. And it's stop. I'm like, okay, I'm leaving <laughs> because this person obviously is not ready. Um, it's not Jesus's name that causes them to leave necessarily. Now I'm not going to discount this completely because this is a person's belief. And if they want to believe this, Mm -hmm. You know, I am not going to say that it's not true, <laughs> but, you know, Anne Druffel wrote a book on this, How to Defend Yourself Against Alien Abduction. It says religious provocation is one of the methods. And she herself had one or two cases. This is the book on it. And uh, what works much more, more often is, no, <laughs> get away from me. You know, what she called willful, you know, I forget what she had a name for it. Uh, Righteous anger, <laughs> which, you know, I have cases of that where people will say, get away from me. I never want to see you again. Go away, go away, go away. I'm not working with you. And it ends their encounters, usually temporarily because they'll come back, but sometimes permanently. And yeah, I talked about this with Dolly Saffron. She's like, oh yeah, we've not worked with people because they lose their minds, you know. But I, this is my personal feeling on this. I don't know that that is an effective method. Now, if you're dealing with a right straight up demon, because those are real, but I don't think they manifest as ETs. It's, I, I investigated demonic hauntings. I personally did. The people who were possessed by, you know, 10 foot tall, dark amorphous forms who tried to possess them and were causing vicious hauntings. It follows a very set pattern. It's a spiritual phenomenon. It's different. It's a haunting. This is not what's going on with the ETs. Now, there's a guy out there who says, well, I have 300 cases of this. And uh, so, I mean, you can talk to him. I'm sure you'll get a different answer. But my assessment that no, ETs are not demonic. And if you're going to call in the name of Jesus and say, stop right now, they'll say, okay, <laughs> that's what you want. We will stop but it's not Jesus doing it. My opinion. You know, I really want to underline that because religion is a very sensitive core belief with people. 
sex, politics, religion. And you can stick UFOs in there because it affects who you are and how you feel about your place in the universe. And that's why this is, you know, some sort of people are diehard skeptics and said, don't talk to me about this. I don't want to talk about it because it's a core belief. And, you, and that suddenly you're dealing with two or three core beliefs at once, you know, sex and um, ETs and religion. It's all coming at people at once. And so it, this is what causes people to have complete spiritual transformations, throw away the worldview. I interviewed one guy who was a diehard Mormon and he says, Preston, I gave it up. <laughs> You know, because as soon as this gray came into my room, I remembered being with him throughout my childhood. Uh, he, I looked upon him as a friend, a father, a mentor, and went on board and had a really benevolent experience at age 23 or so. But all the others weren't so benevolent. It was, it was rough up to that age when he finally clicked, woke up at all. You know, he reached that level of moving beyond the blindness of your belief system. And it can be agnosticism or you know, atheism or whatever you believe in. Uh, I had the good you. fortune to have my belief system destroyed <laughs> by the <laughs> idea that UFOs are real and I was having out-of-body experiences and everything just went whoosh. I'm like, I'm not believing in anything anymore. This is ridiculous. I just need to know what's going on. Right. So, yeah. Right. You have a personal experience, right? That's the best way to... to kind of learn all so, this yeah stuff. it, it so, worked i think it works but perhaps not for the reasons people think so sunny s on. was asking have you ever had a qhht session no i haven't quantum hypnotherapy which is a method basically developed by dolores cannon who mm -hmm. is a good researcher by the way i did have the opportunity to meet her very briefly at a convention, but she had a line of people at her table, and I just wanted to say, hey, you know, I respect you, because her books are good, and what I like about her, what she does is she just lays it out, you know, she's not overlaying any, you know, belief system or interpretation, she's reporting what she's learned, yep. and she uses hypnosis, and I think it is an effective method, if used and done correctly. Uh, I've interviewed a few people. Martin Rivera is another guy, I think, who does a really good job with this. Uh, I've talked, of course, to Barbara Lamb and Yvonne Smith uh, extensively about their use of hypnosis. It 100% works. Uh, and everyone uses slightly different methods. Quantum hypnotherapy is one of them. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Deb's Shakti, she's one who's quite active in the field doing this. I interviewed a lady who's in my book who used it to recall her experiences and it was done correctly. And it's not, you know, a question and answer session. It's where you allow the witness to basically reach a level of relaxation where they can move into their memories in a way that is not leading. And, and they can just sort of say, well, I saw a face and the hypnotist will say, okay, you saw a face <laughs> and repeat what they said. Uh, without, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's very effective. But you, we know from studies that it's not always effective. There's been very, you know, strict. Yeah, say a little bit about the, about that because I've I've talked to people about the positive aspects of it, but what are the, what are some of the risks? And and again, I don't want to make it like it's good or bad. And I'm not talking about QHHT. It could also be regular hypnotherapy session. What yeah. are the the pitfalls and what can you do to kind of mitigate that if somebody's interested in learning more about it? I think the main pitfall would be you get a hold of someone who's a little zealous, might have a belief mm -hmm. system where ETs are trying to take over or the greys are doing this and that or, you know, they, and we'll project that onto your recall and will lead you down their garden path towards what they believe, which I think is what's happened to it. Some prominent researchers who take a very negative viewpoint towards this. That's a danger because we know that people can be led, particularly if they're vulnerable to it in some way. And there's been enough studies on hypnosis where people said, oh, I, I recall this person abusing me and it's not true. <laughs> it did not happen and they can prove it. That's a danger, false memory syndrome. Uh, but I know it works because people who recall under hypnosis are recalling 
the same things people who remember it fully consciously. Another pitfall is, well, you know, I had this missing time event and I went to explore it under hypnosis and I found out I have 20 of these <laughs> and it opened a can of worms and, you know, this is much more extensive than I thought. And it's completely changed my life and that's, you know, something to be prepared for. This can be a lot to deal with suddenly. And that's another pitfall because basically what it comes down to this is what the ETs are telling contactees. It's not really us doing it. You did not want to remember. We facilitated that. You will remember when you're ready. And I've talked to a lot of people who've had that cue or trigger um, something in their lives happens where it brings it all back fully consciously. That's the ideal road. That's what I'm waiting for because I have missing time. <laughs> I would, I've considered hypnosis. I've not done it, but I'm remembering stuff, right? That's, I think, how th the best method, because basically what hypnosis is, is like forcing a flower to bloom. Yeah, it's, you can, it's, but it's not super, it's not necessarily the best method. It can be. I only recommend hypnosis if a person has a very clear-cut reason to do it. They had missing time and they know it. They are having anxieties over this. They are not able to function at a normal level due to what's happened to them. If, if you have crippling anxiety, if you can't sleep, if you feel like you've got PTSD, if you really, 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 really want to know, yes, I think it's good to do. But yeah, there are pitfalls to it. It can become overwhelming. You might not. I've talked to people who were like, okay, you know, I did it, and I kind of regret it. I'm like, oh, really? Why? I said, well, you know, it's not that I don't trust what happened, but it feels very dreamlike. You know, what I, I asked for hypnotic recall, and I got one. I got this weird hypnotic thing, and I still don't know if it's real. Whereas if you were just laying there and you kind of did it through meditation, because that's how Jay Gardner, a guy I interviewed, he talked to, I think it was Leo Sprinkle who does hypnotize people. He says, you know, before I do this, let me give you some meditation techniques. I want you to try this first. And he did it. And he remembered everything himself. It's a much better method. So if you're considering hypnosis, first thing I would ask you to do is write everything down in detail. Because that way, when you go under hypnosis, you can say, well, this is, I remember this. And this is hypnotic. Another thing would be meditate, meditate, meditate. Pick that experience and just sit there and think on it for a month, every day for an hour. And keep writing it down because you get these little details. They will come in, you know, through the back door on the side and like, oh gosh, I do remember it smiled. Oh yeah, it did touch me. I remembered its jumpsuit. It was blue or, you know, little things like that. You can start to build a more clear picture. Third, and this works and it's kind of, I don't know what. I want to say controversial, but it might be considered that dream work. You know, when you go to bed at night, ask to dream about your experience. Because this is how Betty Hill did it. I <laughs> mean, she went to bed that night and she's like, I dreamt I was on board and this happened, and this happened, and this happened. She went under hypnosis and darned if her dream recall wasn't accurate and a little bit more complete, honestly. Uh, and For folks who are just joining us, you're listening to Through a Glass Darkly Radio on United Public Radio, and I'm here talking with UFO researcher Preston Dennett. All right, we are have about, I think, 10 minutes left in the, in the discussion. We talked about the first three, right? So just as a reminder, grays, human-like, and mantids. What other types do you typically see in your... No, we talked about some of the extraordinarily tall humanoids yeah yeah kind of like giant you know because i got a couple more of those i mean there was one lady who contacted me specifically because she's like i saw this thing and i want to know if you've ever heard this i'm like well after she told me I'm like, no i haven't i have not heard this and she described a nine foot tall orange haired humanoid which had not so much orange hair but straw-like protrusions <laughs> well hair but it was very straw-like sticking straight up about three or four inches off of its head a huge chin very high forehead 
wearing a black skin tight jumpsuit and a cape. She muscular, but human, human looking. She was healed of a sort of hypoglycemic type disorder, which wasn't fully diagnosed, but was certainly verified medically. They couldn't, they didn't know what it was though. But that was another one of these tall humanoids. And I get those fairly regularly, but those are somewhat rare. I would say equally rare, but consistent are little blue beings. Dolly Saffron described them. My first case of that was with another sister-in-law <laughs> who saw th these little blue beings along with her sister, by the way, uh, when she was nine years old, I think it was. And she's an artist. She does the cover for my books. I'm like, draw, Christy, draw them. Please draw them. And she did. And they're, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to see Communion, the movie with Christopher Walken about uh, Whitley Strieber's experiences. But there's a scene where one of these kids is dressed up in a little costume in the hallway and frightens the daylight out of Christopher Walken playing Whitley. And it's this little yeah. troll-like blue-skinned being. I think that was the scene. Yeah, but yeah, it's definitely. It looks very much like that. In the movie. Yeah, it looks very much like that. And so she drew them, and little beady eyes, kind of sharpe folded skin, hoods, short, flat faces, stubby fingers. Uh, people don't generally describe much of the body because they're usually cloaked with hoods. And this mm -hmm. one guy I interviewed very well, not very recently, but over the past couple of years. Uh, his account is in my book, Humanoids and High Strangeness. He lived in East Palo, Texas, and he and his little brother were visited, you know, weekly by these little blue beings who, who carried this little wand, which is exactly what my sister-in-law described as well. <laughs> and he contacted me because he saw the drawing she did and just about fell over. It's like, that's, you know, who, who did that? I'm like, that's my sister-in-law. It's like, that's exactly what I saw. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and in fact, the uh, other guy I mentioned briefly, the Mormon, he had one of those come into his room when he was a little kid. He says, you know, I thought it was a gorilla, <laughs> tiny baby gorillas or something, mm -hmm. until I got a good look at it and it looked kind of troll-like. Uh, so that is another type, which is just another ethnicity of humanoid. Because mm -hmm. people are like, all oh, these different races, you know, 50 different races are visiting our planet. And look at you, you're a different race than me. And I'm like, well, no, you're not. We are all humans, every last one of us on this mm -hmm. planet. And I don't care how tall or short you are, or how fat or white, or what color your skin is, or how big your eyes are, your lips, or your nose, or your ears, or anything. You're a human. We're all human. And let's line us up, you know, and look at the variation to, from height to skin color, to shape. And you're gonna see an enormous variation of what we call ancestry and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And let's just for fun, stick a tall white in there and a gray <laughs> and a little blue being and see if anyone can pull them out and say, this one's not human because some of them you would not be able to pull out. They would fit right in because the variation is that pronounced here on this planet alone. Yes, yeah, some of them are clearly <laughs> a little different. Uh, I mean, the mantids, I think, would be pretty easy, you know, in a lineup. But I mean, the, I, I, the point I'm trying to make is this is what contactees are being told that we share genetics. You know, mm -hmm. and, Dolly Saffron, you know, I'm going back to her again because they took her to other planets and she's the most, she's got the best memory of anyone I've heard of in terms of interactions and the most interactions. She's like, I'm telling you, President, there's pine trees on other planets and there's rabbits and there's birds and there's cows and they all look a little different, just like the people look a little different. I mean, she took them to a planet where they were basically Polynesian, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because the Polynesians have you know, again, an oral tradition, as most indigenous cultures do, of, you know, we come from the stars. Uh, so per perhaps there's more to that. Uh, I th I'm not so sure we evolved on this planet because contactees are being told, no, we did not. Uh, so, yeah. yeah our, our circadian rhythms are actually closer to Mars. 
Um, even though Mars yeah. is still very close to the U.S. or to the, to to Earth, but uh, yeah, which is right, what we have. You know, the the guy from Texas told me, but the ETs told him that we came from Mars, which I had to laugh because that's what Dolly says, and you know, I, I've heard this from other people. We had one, did live on Mars in, in one iteration way way back. Now I have to ask you this because it's kind of still in the zeitgeist. We're talking. Yeah, the error report came out it was you know complete gaslighting of humanity uh you know i don't i'm not optimistic that you know our government's going to say anything our uh our et is going to do something a little bit more open in terms of a disclosure sort of thing u.s government be damned well at some point i think if we face an existential crisis and they like, you know what, we need to scoop our people off or anyone who's at that level or ready or wants to go. Yeah, because, you know, God knows they've already done it. You know, look at, I would point to the 1954 wave in France. Mm -hmm. I would point to, well, just know, the, I mean, the U.S. Wave. too. Like, there was, there were massive, like, if you look at the history, it's, it's hard to believe that people have, quote unquote, forgotten most of this stuff. I mean, it was pretty unambiguous. They were flying over the White House. They were doing all sorts of crazy stuff. It was unambiguous, but it's it just kind of disappeared from memory. It's very strange. Yeah. Well, look up the date, November 6, 1957. Challenge you. Look up October, November, 1973. That's called the year of the humanoids, but it was really ramping up on, on those two months where they basically put on what we call a display. And they do this over and over again. I wrote the book Schoolyard UFO Encounters because that's what they're doing. You know, UFOs over driving theaters. Look at all the various waves. They did it over in Mexico City in 1991. Unambiguously, a flying saucer right there stayed for two hours. How much do you need? One guy, Donald Shellcross of Virginia, met the ETs face to face. And they said, he asked them, why don't you disclose? They said, we already have. That was in the 50s. Uh, so they are doing everything except staying there over New York City or L.A. or what have you to a point where, you know, they'd circle jets and try to blow it up. And we don't react well to this. If we were less warlike, I think we'd have a much better chance. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, disclosure has already happened. How many million? We're approaching a million documented sightings encounters and just the databases like APRO and NICAP and QFOS and MUFON and New Fork. And that, that's just the United States. And we're not the By center the way, of the world. <laughs> being in New in MUFON, and I, I know the answer to this, but I think the, the audience will find it interesting. While you were looking in, into various reports that have been stored on that database, have you ever seen one and then it kind of just disappeared from the database? I have, yeah. How often does that? How often does that happen? And what sorts of cases does that happen to? Uh, well, I know people I've talked to are like, "Well, I reported it, and then I, it's gone." And I'm like, "Well, shoot!" And I went looking for it, and sure enough, it's gone. That happened with New Fork. I'm like, "Well, that's weird." I took a screenshot of this one. <laughs> it's not there anymore. Uh, so I don't know how often it happens. And you know, I'm sure there are all kinds of glitches and database problems. No, I don't want to much. immediately point in a nefarious finger at the, all of this, but well, I know but people you were about are very to hack, happy. hack like yeah. a month ago or right. within the last month, right? I'm not sure it's even back up the CMS system, but I support MUFON, you know, yeah. because no, this is not this is not to point fingers at MUFON. It's to point fingers at somebody else. Yeah, I don't think well, here, I don't think this is my, incompetence. That here's my point: is supports. you know, APRO, they caught the CIA spying on them. <laughs> Yeah. One of their field investigators turned out to be flat up CIA. NICAP was basically shut down due to in political infighting. And there were some intelligence officers on the board of directors there. Uh, well, have and... you ever seen the simple sabotage manual from World War II? Uh, oh, created gosh, by no. the Office of Strategic Services, which is a precursor <laughs> to the CIA. No, There's a no, whole no. section on there. There's a whole section on there about how to derail meetings literally like like <laughs> send everything to committees right like reward the people who are the most useless right and 
well, <laughs> like they've thought through this stuff pretty I mean like way back in the 40s they thought we're through dealing this with stuff. a very well funded organized debunking deliberate cover up to make you know witnesses look like fools and you know mm -hmm. slow if not stop the progress of ufo research it's not a joke it's for real so well, I'll give you an example. So there's another, we're kind of running over but i'll give a quick example there's another youtuber who had chris bledsoe on and chris bledsoe mentioned something about tim taylor who was like a intelligence official who worked for the nro may still work for the nro and the space commit or uh space force things like that and his video was doing really well and then all of a sudden it just hit a brick wall so he called his little minder because when you have more than a hundred thousand subscribers you get somebody assigned to you at youtube and the woman said yeah i was told by the you know at the executive level that it's getting shadow banned and there's no documentation on it so i can't tell you what it is so my hmm. guess is that someone high up in the intelligence community just called an executive at youtube and just said just you know bury it and that's kind yeah. of what happened it's unfortunate that we have to deal with this but th that's why you know ufo organizations have such a hard time because we're up against a deliberate cover-up well i mean i think you just have to operate under the mindset that everything your government tells you is, is probably a lie and uh we're just not going to get disclosure through them we're gonna have to get it uh by by ourselves um you know even if it's dangerous tough i mean tough like if they hey, they're supposed the to protect us yeah. yeah they're not protecting us right and the other thing yeah. it's it's destroying them like it's not it's not helping that you can't like everything they say nobody believes it even if it's true nobody believes it so it just further undermines their authority. And it's almost like this positive feedback loop where they tell a lie in order to prevent something. And then it just makes the next lie even more damaging and more damaging and more damaging until you have a, until it spirals out of control. So, all right. Uh, I think we're kind of near the end of the hour. So any last words, uh, something positive. Cause I, I just went down a dark, dark road. <laughs> My apologies for that. Yeah. Well, I, First, thanks, Sean. I think we had, you know, had a good time. Well, also, happy St. Paddy's Day from, you know, your favorite Irishman. I, I don't even, I've like buried the lead on that one. And there's somebody in the, in the comments kept telling me, happy St. Patrick's Day, happy St. Patrick's There's a Kennedy. There's a Kennedy somewhere in the, in the comments. So, I had to say it. <laughs> yeah, happy St. Patrick's Day. I'm part Irish, so hey. <laughs> That's um, the best yeah. part. That's the best part. Okay. <laughs> Um, thanks for having me on the show. It's an important subject. Uh, you yeah. can't hide the truth. Sooner or later, it's going to come up because it is true. Uh, I don't trust our government. So, yeah, I'd say just leave fear behind. You know, this is a new era for humanity. It's time to embrace this. You're not being credulous or, you know, what do you call it? Not ignorant, but, uh, yeah, well, credulous is the best word I can think of right now if you believe in this stuff. Because the fact is we're victims of a cover-up and, and yeah. uh, it it is true you know and it, it saddens me that people say well how do you know that this is true i'm like well are you going to believe our governments or are you going to believe the million of people who say they're seeing this stuff but preston they're here from the government and they're here, here to help <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah i think it's a new era so people are embracing this it's awesome we're not alone out there leave fear behind look to your you know, do your own research don't ask other people you know don't believe me do your own research ask your friends and family and co-workers i dare you <laughs> you'll find out no yeah. i mean you literally <laughs> once you have a youtube channel and it gets over five thousand subscribers people will call you and tell you their stories there's actually somebody i need to refer to you but i can't say anything about their case because they were very they don't you know yeah i'm behind about 100 emails for anyone listening out there saying well i sent an email and he hasn't called me back i am working on it because i am getting swamped right now which is awesome you know i absolutely love it keep them coming and i'll get back i'll get to you i promise <laughs> but please be patient because yeah it is time for truth and it's coming out and i'm so excited about it all right well thank you everyone thank you preston thanks dolly in the background and uh <laughs> I, <laughs> love you all so happy saint patty's day and uh, don't drink too much day. <laughs> Have a great night. You too. <laughs>